I thank the Chief Rabbi who's given of his time to be with us this evening to share with us that inner insight to finding clarity in the chaotic world. Thank you, Rabbi Stern. Um, it's so lovely to be here at, um, at Sidlam Shul. Uh, so, so enjoy the times of a Pesach, Rosh Hashanah, and the other times um, to visit this, uh, this wonderful congregation, which, um, which has such vibrancy at every level. And I want to take the opportunity to pay tribute to Rabbi and Rebetzin Stern for the, the remarkable work that you do, the inspired leadership, the warmth, the compassion, the kindness, the, uh, the innovation and the energy. And uh, I think that, that Sydney remains a very important beacon of light and an example of uh, the vibrancy and the vitality and the central dimension of, um, of our big shuls. So it's, uh, it's indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here. And now we can have a look at what Purim provides us in terms of a frame of reference because we can look around at the world both locally and internationally, and we see so many uh, forces which are at play and create so much uncertainty. And it's not only on a local, national, political level or, or a global level or what's going on in Israel. It is also in our own lives. From a, from a very personal point of view, every person is grappling with different factors in life. And we're always looking to control and we're looking to impose a sense of order on a world which refuses to, be, to, to have order imposed upon it. And we try to make sense of the world in which we live. And there's the human tendency, and it's a natural tendency of every human being. We're looking for patterns. We're looking for predictability. We're looking for a sense of certainty in the world. And yet, life in this world, in Olam Hazer, by the very nature of life in this world, it defies prediction. It defies order. And, and, and that is, in, in essence, the struggle, the struggle with chaos itself. And the struggle with chaos goes right back to the very beginnings of creation. Because when God created the world, it says, it was tohu vavohu, there was chaos and void, v'choshek al pnei tohom. And the, the Midrash points out, our sages point out, that God created the chaos in the first place. Because one of the foundation principles of Judaism, of the Torah, is that God created this world, yesh mi'ayin, something from nothing. That there, there was nothing. And then God brought all of existence into being. He didn't work with existing matter. So when the book of Bereshit and the book of Genesis says at the beginning of, of history that there was chaos and void and there was darkness over the abyss, that means that God actually created that in order to, for, for that to be, God actually created the chaos at the beginning because if he didn't create it, why was it there? It wasn't as if there was pre-existing matter that was chaotic and dark and void and then God somehow formed it into this universe. The, the most important foundation principle when we refer to God as the creator, that means the creator of everything. There was nothing before Bria, Yesh, Me'ayin, creation, from nothing. And that means, therefore, says the Midrash, that God actually created what was described at the beginning of the book of Genesis, including the chaos. And, and that means that embedded into the very fabric of existence, and uh, Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik makes this point in his famous essay, Halachic Man, he makes the point that God willfully embedded chaos into the very fabric of existence, which means there's a force of chaos which lies beneath the surface of everything that we engage with from the most mundane level to the most uh, sophisticated and sublime. On the most mundane level, the human being and this world tends towards chaos. If you don't look after your garden, it is going to, to become overgrown and it will not, be, will not be a livable space. Your pool will go green if you don't look after it and the house will turn to, um, uh, uh, turn to ruin if it's not looked after, if, there's, if one doesn't regularly paint it and waterproof it. That is the nature of existence. Everything tends towards chaos. The human body tends towards chaos. We don't look after the human body through personal hygiene, through, through health and fitness and all of these things. The human body also tends towards chaos. It's built into it. And so to the spiritual world is also tends towards chaos. That's why we have mitzvahs which impose structure and order. The very dimension, the very nature of a mitzvah of the halakha is that it is a framework. It's a structure. It imposes a sense of order and to, to give us the framework to develop ourselves spiritually. So all of this amounts to the following is that chaos, unpredictability, 
The, the, the fact that life is not certain, the fact that we cannot control events, that we cannot control the future, all of that is not something that just happens to be. It's not a departure from the norm. It is the norm. Chaos is the norm. Unpredictability is the norm of human existence. And therefore, we have to make peace with it. We have to find a framework to deal with it. We need a sense of being able to understand how do we approach it, how do we understand and accept that that is the nature of this world, and then within the context of that, not only live and tolerate it, but use that framework actually to thrive in our lives. And that's where I think that, that Purim comes into it, because Purim, the very essence of this festival of Purim, is the nature of chaos itself. And if you think about it, that was the name of Purim. Where does this festival come from? You know, if you were looking for a name for this festival, it would probably be the very last name that you would have chosen. Because what is this festival about? What happened on Purim? What happened on Purim is that there was an attempted genocide. We're talking in the context of Jewish history, um, more than, more than um, 2,500 years ago plus, when, the, um, when, when we were talking about the, um, the, the, the exile, when we were found ourselves in, under the, the control of the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire had destroyed the first temple, sent us into exile, and now we were, the, the return to Israel had just begun, and we were under the, the Persian uh, Empire, and this decree was imposed for the attempted genocide against all Jews, this decree that was initiated by Haman, but it was implemented by the king Achashverosh, and the, the, the methodology of the decree, and if we ask what was the essence of what was going on in Purim, there was an attempt to wipe out every Jew, and the Maral makes the following point. It was one of the few times in Jewish history where every single Jew was actually under the political control of a single empire and a single emperor. And therefore, had they been successful, there would not be a Jew alive today. Even at the darkest moments of, uh, of Nazi Germany, there were Jews who were not under the control of Hitler. There were Jews in America, in Australia, in South Africa, Jews in, in, in Israel. There were Jews scattered all over the world, of course, we, we lost to, uh, you know, with, 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 with horror and with sadness, we lost European Jewry because they were under the control of, of Hitler, but there were parts of the Jewish world that were not under his control. But during the time of Purim, everybody was under the control of Achashverosh, everyone was under the jurisdiction of Haman. Had they been successful, God forbid, there would not be a single Jew alive today. That was the, the, the essence of that decree. And what happened then? through the intervention of Mordechai and Esther and through the divine plan that, that, that God had crafted at that moment, they are able to intercede to give permission and support from the king to defend themselves. They're able to defend themselves against the attempt at genocide and the Jewish people are saved. That is a remarkable story. That is why we celebrate Purim. Where does the name Purim come from? It is the method that Haman used to choose the date for the annihilation of the Jewish people by casting lots and therefore the festival is called Purim. Could there be anything which is less critical to the story than how he chose the date? What difference does it make what date it was on? If it had been another date, it would, it would it not have been a serious threat. And furthermore, why do we care how he chose the date? Even if you say the date was significant, why do we care how he chose the date? So why call the festival Purim of all the names? Purim meaning the casting of lots, and it's not even a Hebrew word. It was, it, it was a Persian word that was, that was used, and this is where the festival gets its name from. It, except for this, and I think buried inside this name is the clue to understanding what this festival is all about, because the word Purim, the casting of lots, that means haphazard, by chance, with, uh, with, without plan, chaos. And that's what the Jewish people were facing at that time. Chaos, chaos and unpredictability, fear, vulnerability and uncertainty of the future. And, and it was all of those forces that Haman brought to bear in order to make his impact and in order to, to carry out his plans. And for the people who were experiencing it, they were feeling their own vulnerability in the deepest sense of the word. And they had no sense of being able to predict one moment they were, they were protected citizens in the empire of Achashverosh. In the next moment, they had the sniper's sights directly on them, 
focusing on them and they faced the complete annihilation. They moved from the light into the darkness and there was, and there was no sense of the warning of what this was, that it was going to come. And it therefore made them feel as if they were living in a world of complete chaos and a world of unpredictability and a lack of control. And it made them also feel that they were alone and where was God? Because at the heart of creation and what the heart of we understand about God is Seder, is order. When we look at the, the, the physical universe that God created, He created a universe with laws, with precision, with a sense of coherence. In fact, Albert Einstein writes about this and it's uh, well known, his comments about seeing the hand of God in the creation of this world because he saw the incredible the incredible coherence of the entire system of nature, how it all holds together. You can feel the order. You can feel the laws of nature. You can feel the sense of, of God creating a world that you can predict. That is what the laws of nature. So when we encounter chaos, we then start to feel, but where is God? If there's chaos here, where is God? God is order. He is structure. He's the very essence of what order and structure and planning is all about. He planned and built a world. He used a framework. And, and then when we encounter that shakes, that shakes our faith and it, sh and it shook their faith too in the sense of being having this, uh, the, the, the feelings of their own deep vulnerability. At the same time, what they learned in that journey was that as we, as we began, that God built into God built into creation and into human existence. There's the laws of nature and there's the predictability, but there is chaos. And so much of human history and even of our own personal lives is the struggle between these two. Where do we feel the presence of God? How do we find faith in chaotic times? How do we see the hand of God when things seem out of control? How do we deal with, the, with our own very deep sense of vulnerability? And, and why does God put us into, into a position like this? I think that Purim gives us a framework for answering some of these questions. And how, how do we go about that? The, the Talmud in, in Chulin on page 139 asks, where do we find Esther min Torah minayin? Where do we find a reference to Queen Esther in the Torah? And it references a passage in the book of Devarim in uh, chapter 31, where, it's, where God says, By your mahu, on that day, Haster astir is panai, I will hide my face. Vanochi, Haster astir panai, by your mahu, on that day, I will hide my face. Chapter 30, verse 18. And the, 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 the Torah he had describes a situation of the hiddenness of God in this world. And that we need to grasp. What does that mean that God is hidden? When it says that he's hidden and he will hide his face, and the word Esther means hiddenness, and God is hidden in the book of Esther, you will not find God's name mentioned explicitly once. We have, uh, according to our tradition, when it talks about Hamelech, it is a, a reference to, to God, but you will not find any direct reference to God's name in the book of Esther. His presence is hidden. The very name Esther means hiddenness, and in the hiddenness is where we see the chaos. If we can pierce the veil of the hiddenness, then we will not see the chaos. We're able to then see and feel the presence of God all around. And, um, and we need to understand that concept because we, we, uh, we, we find ourselves now, we're just before Purim, and, and the next festival that we celebrate is Pesach. And the Gomorrah says that Purim and Pesach have to be as close together as possible. How could they, you know, when do you have a choice? I mean, the dates are fixed. But we, if, if there's a leap year and there's a second Adar, you have an option. Purim could be in the first Adar or the second Adar. The Gomorrah says it has to be in the second so that it is as close to Pesach as possible because we want to link Geula to Geula, redemption to redemption. They are both festivals of redemption. So by making that statement, the Talmud is teaching us that Pesach and Purim are both festivals of redemption and therefore need to be as close together as possible. But they are vastly different. Why do we have a Pesach and a Purim if they're both festivals of redemption? And in actual fact, if you think about the miracles of Pesach, they dwarf the miracles of Purim. 
The miracles of Pesach are the ten plagues, the splitting of the sea. It's miracles which, um, which the whole world can see. So if we celebrate that and then the miracles of Purim, okay, there was a miracle, the Jewish people were saved, but it seems comparatively to be such a small miracle in comparison to the incredible great miracle of uh, the great miracles of Pesach. There, there is a qualitative difference between the miracles of Pesach and Purim. In Pesach, God's presence is revealed. He's not Hester Panim. There's no hiding of God's face. God was there for everybody to see. And in fact, God says to, to Moshe, he says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm making these 10 plagues and I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh so that I can make my signs and wonders in Egypt and that everybody will see in the entire world. Egypt was a superpower. God broke the superpower of that generation with open miracles. Everybody could see eventually even the, um, the, the uh, magicians of Pharaoh and all of his advisors were said, this is the finger of God, this is the hand of God. Why are you continuing to, to defy God? It was clear to everybody, God's presence and through the ten plagues and then through the splitting of the sea, it was so obvious to everybody. And yet in Purim, the miracles of Purim are hidden. And, and there we have the Hester Panim. Now why, why both? And, and here it goes to, to the heart of our relationship with God. We are in a partnership with God. Our role in this world, says the Gemara, is to be a shutaf like Orish Baruch Hu to be a partner with God in creation. We are here to partner with God to make this world into a better place. And that partnership will change, depend, our role in the partnership changes depending on God's role. When God's role over Pesach is the role of the, the Almighty King, whose presence is felt, who, who's, who reveals himself, and you can see his awesome power, then our role is much more passive. When his role is so active that his role is a, a role which says, you know, here I am, I will do everything for you. All you need to do is wait in your homes. You need to put the blood on, on the doorpost. Everything else God is going to do for you. Pack your matzah and get ready. Hashem will take you to wherever you need to go. And you'll, he'll make sure that when you go into the desert, you will have the, the food that you need. You'll have the water that you need. You'll have everything taken care of. We were passive passengers in, in that entire experience. And our greatest role on Pesach in that generation and all future generations is to remember, to recall, and to retell the story. But that is fundamentally a passive response. God is doing everything. Our job is we better not forget what he did because that lays the foundation of our faith in Hashem for all future generations. So we remember what he did. We, we, write, we, we tell the story. We tell our children. We make sure that all future generations do not forget what happened. But the, the, the role of storytelling, the role of recall, the role of remembering is fundamentally passive. God is doing everything and we are in a passive role. So when we're in this partnership, when he is active, then we are passive. But in Hester Panim, when God hides his face, the roles are reversed. Then he goes into the passive. He hides behind he hides behind the veil of the chaos of this world where we have to go and seek him out. And then we have to get active and proactive then Mordechai and Esther have you ever felt at times in life you just wish if God would only just tell me what to do then I'll know what to do if God will just tell me what's going to happen then I will know but then we will move into the role of being passive God is God is hiding behind the chaos of this world because he wants us to come forward to be his partners and in the early phases of our history when miracles were abundant and there was prophecy and there was clarity and everything was laid out and there were the miracles of the first temple all of that was laid out we were in a passive role and and that's wonderful because in that passive role we don't have any work to do we can we can just listen and take heed but the the problem with being in that passive role is that we don't own it we don't own our relationship and we don't own our responsibilities and therefore what what jewish history proved is that when we had all of these miracles. We then went into a phase where we, we started to forget and we went astray and we felt that we did not have to determine history. It would all be done for us. And the Torah actually predicts it. 
the passage that comes where it says this in chapter 31 in the book of Devarim. This is the final words that Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people as scripted to him by God. And he's giving them a prediction for the future. And Moses is, is, uh, gather, has gathered the people. He's, he, is, he knows that his end is, uh, is, is, is nigh. In fact, his, his yortzeit, the, the, the yortzeit of Moshe Rabbeinu, the seventh of Adar, is, uh, is right at this time. Moshe Rabbeinu delivers these words. And it's, it's remarkable that he delivers these words perhaps within the week of, of, uh, of, of the events of Purim taking place themselves. And he, he gives over the words that God scripts for him. And he says that there will be a time that God's face will be hidden. But he frames it and he says, Vayomer, God explains to Moses what to say. And he says, look, Vayomer um, Hashem al Moshe, God says to Moses, your time to die is coming and you will lie down with your forefathers. And then when, when you have left this world, the nation will one day go astray. And when they go astray, then I will hide my face from them. And then they're going to have to find their way back to me. And, and, and so that dynamic changes instead of God being on the active side and we being the passive recipients, we then have to step up and respond and find the clarity and we have to then play our role and find our way back to him. But we have the clue of how to do it because in the very partial where it talks about this, that God says, Va'anochi haster astir panai bayomahu and I will hide my face from you on that day. The very next verse says, Kisvu Lachem Esashira Hazois. Go and write this song. The Lamda is Bnei Yisrael and teach it to the Jewish people. What is the song that he is referring to? So Rashi says it's Parshat Hazinu, but actually the um, the 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 um, the Torah Balpeh learns from this. The Oral Torah learns from this. The Mitzvah. To write a Sefer Torah is learned from this verse. When it says write the song, it is referring to the song of the entire Torah. The Torah is called a song. It is called music. It creates the harmony. It creates the beauty. It creates the meaning. It creates the, the sense of purpose, the upliftment, the grandeur of our lives comes from the Torah and the mitzvahs and Hashem's wisdom. And therefore God says, uh, write this. It is so significant that this verse comes immediately. The verse after God says, I will hide my face. And then he says, I will hide my face. And, and as if to say, if God is hidden, how are we going to find him? How are we going to find him? We could find him in nature because you will see his presence in the laws of nature. But as soon as we leave the laws of nature and we look into the human universe and we see the chaos and we see the suffering and we see everything that is going on around us and we see the unpredictability of it all and we feel our own vulnerability and then we are searching for him. And where is he in all of this? And so the Torah says, you will find me, go into the Torah. That will be your roadmap to find Hashem. And we will find Hashem through the Torah, which we will learn. We will find Hashem through the mitzvahs that we will do. And then we will feel His presence. And we will feel His presence with us, with us in the, in the chaos of it all. Because what, what, what is so profoundly significant in this is God says I will hide myself someone who is hiding is there he doesn't say I will abandon you he doesn't say you will leave and abandon my Torah and therefore I will abandon you God forbid he does not say that he says you won't be able to see me you won't be able to see me but I will still be there and if you look carefully, you will find me. And that is what the experience the Jewish people went through at the time of Purim. They faced this Purim, the sense of uncertainty, the casting of lots, where one moment they were safe, the next moment lots were cast and their a date was set for the entire annihilation of the Jewish people. But before that date had been set, God already had in place Queen Esther, who had replaced Vashti, and she was at the right place at the right moment. And when she didn't know what to do, she said, well, maybe how can I go? I'm going to jeopardize my life. And, uh, and, and Mordechai says to her that maybe for this moment, is this not the moment that he got the Malchut, that you came to, the, to, to royalty for this moment to be able to intervene on behalf of the Jewish people? He saw the plan of Hashem. He explained it to Esther. She saw the plan of Hashem. She risked her life. She intervened and she saved the Jewish people. All of that had been set up. And then you feel and sense 
God's presence in all of the events that were taking place. And that was the experience. They had to go through the feelings of vulnerability and chaos and then rediscover the presence of Hashem. And the mitzvahs of Purim show us how to find God in this world. His hidden presence in this world. And we find His presence by being His active partner. Either in Pesach, He is going to be the active partner and we're going to passively tell His story. On Purim, He is going to hide and be passive and He's going to wait for us to tell His story and to come forward and find Him and show His presence there. And the, the, the four mitzvahs of Purim Give us the blueprint for how to find Hashem in this world. Of course, the entire blueprint is the Torah and the Mitzvah. It says, But what dimensions? We will find God in the people around us. Mishloach Manot. You will find God in the friends, community, support, love, relationships, the sense of society, the sense of Am Yisrael, what it means to be part of the Jewish people. That is where you will find God through, through the the very existence of the notion of community, of the notion of Am Yisrael, of the Jewish people. We will find Hashem in Matanas Lev Yoinim, in gifts to the poor, through the Spirit of God that shines forth on the face of every human being. Chavi Adam Shani Rebetzelim, beloved, is the human being created in God's image. We will find God in people. We will see the presence of God shining forth from every human being. That is what, that is what so many of the mitzvahs of the Torah are based on. The mitzvahs of Bain Adam Lechaveiro between one human being and another is the, the mitzvahs which guide us on how to treat one another with care, with love, with dignity, with respect. To understand, as our sages say in Pirkavot, that the, the, the dimension and the greatness of the human being is that we are created in God's image to see the presence of God on every human being. As the Mishnah Pirkavot says, Have a Kabbalist called Adam B'Sav Panim Yafas, receive every person with, uh, with warmth and with kindness. Or have Shalom, Baroida Shalom, be a person who pursues peace and loves peace and has a, a warmth and a kindness and a gentleness. Find God in the people around and bring out the godly within yourself and the godly within the people around you through kindness, through compassion, through community. And then it says the mitzvah of Sa'uda of having a, a festive meal on Purim. And the festive meal on Purim is about finding God in the physical pleasures of this world and the physical experiences of this world because he created everything and so that guides us on how to understand that when eating and drinking and, uh, and and enjoying this world we can feel God's presence because he gave us all of the gifts of this world he helped us and he and he benefited us and that's why we say a blessing when we eat food when we when we smell beautiful spices when we see the ocean, when we see a rainbow, when we see the and enjoy the physical, the, the, the material, physical parts of this world, but as a gift from God to see and feel God's presence in the physical dimension of this world. And then we read the book of Esther, Mikra Megillah. These are the four mitzvahs. Mishloach Manot, Matanas Lev Yonim, bonds of love and friendship and society and compassion. It is the Sa'uda celebrating and enjoying the physical. And then finally, it is the mitzvah of reading the Megillah. And, and the mitzvah, the mitzvah of reading the Megillah is the mitzvah of discovering Hashem's presence. It is the mitzvah of discovering Hashem's presence in all of the events that surround us, to have bitachon, to have trust. And we find that through learning Torah. Ultimately, we want to understand God, want to feel His presence, want to discover Him, want to see and feel and understand who He is. We do that through learning His Torah because that is the book that He wrote. Those are the, His ideas. We want to know about Him. That is where we go. And the reading of the Megillah is indeed that very interesting thing. The bracha, the blessing that He said before the, before the Megillah is Al Mikra Megillah. Not lishmoa, not to listen to the Megillah. When the shofar, it is lishmoa to hear the shofar because that's experiential. It is an experience. We listen. It's to hear the, the sounds of the shofar that has an emotional impact. The Megillah is through reading and understanding it. And, uh, and, and we fulfill that publicly when one person reads it. They read it. We listen and fulfill our mitzvah. But we are reading. We're not just listening. Reading means reading, means reading life. Reading means learning, understanding, discovering, seeing the presence of Hashem. We do that through trust 
And we do that through the learning of Torah because when we learn Torah, we look at the world through the eyes of Hashem. When we read Megillas Esther, we feel and see the presence of Hashem. We see the order beneath the chaos. We have a glimpse of His greatness. We have a glimpse of His order. We have a glimpse of His, of his plans. It's only a glimpse because as human beings, we can only see a glimpse. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, and he was at the pinnacle of his spiritual greatness. And he had a moment to ask God any question. And, uh, and, and he said to God, I want to ask you a question. Show me your glory. According to the Gemara, the question that he asked is, I don't understand suffering in this world. Tzadik Viralo, why are there righteous people that suffer? Rosha Vatovlo, why are there wicked people that prosper? And then God said to him, Lo Irani Adam Vachai, no man can see me and live. To understand all of that, you would have to understand me. And then God says to him, You will see my back. You'll see a glimpse. What is it? God doesn't have a back, he has no body. It means you will you will see a glimpse of it. There will be moments that you will see glimpses of this this ultimate plan of Hashem, we will never see the full picture and we will never fully understand it. But understanding, but, but what we do through those glimpses and in the moments of Purim, where we see a glimpse of what looks like in the words of Haman Purim, the casting of lots, which is so random and so chaotic and so unpredictable, we look and pierce the veil of Purim and we see beneath that Esther, we move aside Purim and we see Esther. We see this isn't chaos. God is there. He's controlling. He is present. He hides beneath it, but he is there. He is present and he is holding us. And ultimately, we, we are in his loving embrace. We, we often don't understand how things turn out. We cannot begin to comprehend this world. But we know one thing. Chaos is merely the veneer. It is merely the externality. Beneath that is Hashem who is holding everything together and is holding us in His loving embrace. And on Purim, we therefore make peace with the chaotic world in which we live because we can feel Hashem. We see and discover Hashem in the people around us. We feel and discover Hashem in the magnificence of this physical world. And we see and discover Hashem in the incredible wisdom that He left us, Ve'ata. Kisvu lachem esashira hazos. I will hide my face. And the very next verse he says, but now go and write yourself a Sefer Torah. Go and, and see the music. Because what is music? Music is when you take disparate notes, which don't seem to amount to anything. But when you piece them together, something beautiful emerges. There is an order. But it's not an order which is a structured order like mathematics or the building of a, of a, a, a brickwork that, that makes a construction. There is something which is spiritual there. There's something which moves. There is something which is intangible that creates the beauty of the experience. And from the chaos comes the beauty. From that chaos comes the order. And we see that music when we learn Torah and connect to Hashem. And so that is the great joy of Purim, to see past Purim and to see Esther, to see that God is hidden and therefore if he's hidden, he's actually present and he is with us. And when we have his presence with us and we see his presence in the people around us and discover his wisdom in how to look at our lives and un understand the purpose and the vision of why we are here as individuals, as part of the Jewish people, then we can truly experience the joy of what it is to be alive, to live in this world and to embrace the uncertainty of this world with the joy of God's presence that brings us that ultimate sense of joy. Purim Sameach to all. Sure. <laughs>